Okay, good morning. I'm Thor Bob van Elselingen. Today we're going to be talking about data-oriented design and modern C++. So first of all, we're going to start by defining what those mean to me, right? These are very broad terms and I think most people here will have different interpretations. So let's take a look at some modern C++. Uh, let's take a look at this. Wait, that went quickly. Okay. We have a lot of getters and setters, even though we're not having any invariants. You see a nice virtual over there, right? We're doing a whole lot of inheritance, overrides, more of that, more of that. We have a beautiful function signature over here, right? Shared pointer to vector to unique pointer to transaction. So everything works and everything's safe. I don't think this is modern C++. Like some people might think it is. I think when it comes down to it, what are the goals of modern C++? Right? We want to be declarative. Think of the STL. We want to have names. We want to do things right. We want to be simple. We want to use value types. And we actually want to minimize side effects. Right? This is not the object orientation that we used to know before. We don't want to do that kind of stuff. And we want to prevent user error by using strong types. So maybe a, an example that's a bit more fair is the one you see in front of you right now. Right? We have relatively simple types, just some free functions that use them. And if we look at our final function, this seems a lot more reasonable to me. The exact code doesn't really matter for this example. OK, now let's talk about the force that's been shaping C++, I think, for the last couple of years, data-oriented design. So is this <coughs> data-oriented design, right? We have some you know, C arrays. We have some, a lot of pointer arithmetic. You know, if, if I see this, I'm a bit worried, right? We have these, these for loops, which are just raw. We know not to do this. So is this data-oriented design? Not necessarily, right? If you read the literature, if you see some of the talks, what I see is you know, a lot of focus on simple transformations, right? You want to minimize the required state. We don't want to add state to uh, make our abstractions work. And we want to rely on existential programming, which means we don't want to do all this checking to see if data might exist. We want to uh, write our transformations knowing that it's already there. We want to access our data directly, right? We don't want to check for invariants. We don't want to go through like a lot of pointers to get to our data. We just want to see our data. And most importantly, I think we want to lay out our data to fit those transformations, right? So we don't want to lay out our data just so it makes sense. We want to lay out, we want to lay it out in a way that makes sense for our transformations. So let's take a look at this, right? We have some simple code, some simple free functions, right? This all seems to fit our criteria. And some of you might have noticed that this is the same example I gave for good modern C++, except that I cheated a bit, right? What we have here is an implementation of a struct of arrays, right? We split up all the member functions and put them into separate arrays, dealt with caching. I'm not going to go into why. There are great talks about that. That's not this talk. But this is important, <coughs> because if you want to write modern C++-like code, and you want to do this, you want to have a structure of arrays, you're into big trouble. So should we just give up, right? Is the sun setting on C++? We're just not able to have like nice code and good performance. Well, maybe. Let's take a look. First, we're going to take a look at the memory model, right? We have a struct through here, and we have an object, right? Actually, if we take a look at the memory model, this is called a complete object, right? It's a, a struct. That's not in any other struct or class. It's in a, in a function on the stack, maybe a global variable. And then we take a look at our member variables. These are actually member sub-objects of foo, right? All these orange parts. And we automatically get an offset, right? We know this, but you know, this is, you know, it's not necessarily the way it has to be. And then we take a look at C, which is a member sub-object of bar, right? And its offset is also to bar, not to the complete object of foo. So what we've just seen is that our logical layout is mapped to continuous physical layout, right? It's, it's mapped immediately. You don't have to do anything. It's done for you. And that also means that our object identity is also represented physically, right? It's a memory address. It's a pointer. It's a reference. What that means is that as soon as we want to lay out our types in a way that is not continuous in memory, we lose our identity, right? We, we, you cannot have a pointer to something that's in three different blocks of memory. And this starts to break a lot of our fundamental abstractions. 
So, we're gonna catch some layouts. <clears throat> First, we're gonna look at some, uh, just dealing with multiple layouts that are just still one piece of continuous memory to build up our abstractions. Right, so we have this struct here, and we have a, a free function that uses it. And then we have a, a second layout here, just a member switch around. Function work. So let's say we were to refactor from the fact3f to the secondary representation, that would just work, right? Our user code wouldn't change unless you're doing like weird pointer stuff, but let's not get into that. But let's say we have this external function, right? We can't just, you know, use our fact3f. Well, there is a relatively simple solution. We just write conversions and it works. It might not be efficient, but it does work and it means our user code can stay the same. Now let's say we have this function as a member function. Well, you know, we can still do this, right? We'll just static cast to the primary layout and it works. But to me, this is not a great solution, right? <coughs> Our user code changes. It's not necessarily quite efficient. So we can just implement it in our secondary layout, right? What we do is we just move from our secondary layout to our first layout, our primary layout. We call the function, store the result, move all the state back, and then just return the result. Now, if this all gets inlined, this can actually be like really efficient, but you know, that's, that's a big if. Furthermore, let's take a look at this <coughs> example, right? We wanna do continuation style passing and we return a reference to ourselves. Well, how do we translate a function like this? The way I think we might be able to do uh, do this, even though it is quite hacky, is we just assume that it's returning a reference to itself and we assert it. This is not pretty, but at least it allows us to translate these kinds of functions. <clears throat> and there's also some work ongoing in Clang at the moment, which is a, a call site indication of force inline, right? Which would allow us to nearly guarantee that all these functions are inline. And when they are, the compiler is able to see that it's just, you know, memory that we're copying around unnecessarily and is actually able to eliminate it, right? So we get like pretty good assembly generation, at least in simple cases. All right. So when we're dealing with multiple layouts this way, we have some limits on the types we can use, right? If we can't move or copy the members around, well, then we can't do these automatic transformations. And any functions that leaks the identity, right? That registers itself using a pointer, that can never work, right? Because it's a pointer to a temporary. So there are some limitations on the types we can use this approach for. <clears throat> the nice thing is that all these layouts are um, talking about the same type effectively. They have the same public interface and they represent the same value set, which means we can losslessly convert them, not lossless in lossless performance, but all the values map. And we can do this relatively trivially using reflection. Let's start talking about more interesting layouts. Let's do a hot cold split. So we have a struct here. And let's say some of these members, we just want to put away and make them cold, right? We want to not have them in our hot cache. Now, in the future with reflection, that's a theme of this talk. We're assuming language level reflection. We should just be able to annotate these data members and convert them to something like this. We make a new struct cold and we just have a unique pointer to it. But at least for my criteria, this doesn't work well, right? These functions don't, don't match up, which means that if you change your object, object to a hot cold struct, well, then you need to change user code. But it also means that if you move any members from hot to cold or back, you have to change all user code, which might be okay for you. But at least when, for me, it's not. So we introduce a new abstractions, properties. Now properties, some of you might be familiar with them from a language like C Sharp. Basically, you can think of them as a function returning an L value reference, but to the language, it seems like it's just a member variable, right? So this property of uh, asset ID just returns or maps to a string. It has an expression, right? Called data asset ID, and it's called asset ID, which means that in our example, this just works. And I actually, you know, I'll show you later why, but this actually compiles in modern C++ with UB. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
we've now used these properties so we can, at least from a code generation standpoint, easily transform our code, right? But they are proxies with all the implications of proxy objects. Right. Now we're gonna make it really interesting. The structure of arrays, right? So we have our vector here, quite minimal, x, y, z. We can uh, add it to itself and we have a magnitude function, right? Now we're gonna make a structure of arrays version of that, right? For each member variable, using reflection, we just instantiate a couple of STD arrays of the right types but our user code is, you know, not quite nice. I like the code on the left a lot more than I like the code on the right. We're, but we're sort of forced to do the code on the right because how could you do the code on the left, you know, without having references, without having pointers? Well, maybe you guessed already, right? We're doing more proxies. Um, <clears throat> so this proxy object is basically just a different layout of VEC except that you know it's using a pointer to the SOA array and an index to do this conversion, right? We just use some properties and we're able to generate all of those same functions. This means that we can now get really good code, right? We can just use the STL even though our layout is like completely different. And this also means that if you're just refactoring, you can just change the type of the array and all of your user code can stay the same, which makes it really easy to experiment with different layouts, right? Doesn't mean you won't have to change your code at all, but it makes it really easy to make these kinds of transformations. We have some issues though, right? Let's say we just wanna take a reference or a pointer. This doesn't work, right? It's a proxy object. We cannot take an L value reference to it. And if we take our mock pointer, it's not actually a pointer. So also, it doesn't work. Well, we have more new abstractions, right? Auto ref just pretends it's an L value reference, maps to an L value reference, or something that promises, you know, I'm actually an L value reference, even if it's not the case. And we do the same for the pointer. And you might notice that the syntax here is different, and we'll go into that a bit later. Now we have the same problem if we actually want to explicitly name our type, right? If we have a, an L value reference to VEC, we still want to say, be able to say, okay, I have a reference to something that is a, a vector or vector-like, but this doesn't work with our auto ref, right? So again, we introduce some other abstractions that are able to deal with explicitly naming the type that you're okay with getting any layout of, right? So this is uh, <clears throat> this is generic, which means you can also use it in generic code to deal with any possible layout. Um, and this will all just be deduced at compile time, right? So there's no runtime implication of you broadening the scope of your reference or pointer. Okay, so I have some, a little translation table here, right? On the left, we have what you would currently have in your code. And on the right, you'd see the translation to sort of a new type of abstraction, right? I just added the ML, so it's, it's clear, like this is not standard library or anything, because it gets a bit confusing with, for instance, a unique pointer or a shared pointer. You should be able to make the same transformation. So let's take a look at how these actually work, right? We have our auto ref, which is a templated type. And we determine whether a type T is either a proxy, which means we, it tells us it's a proxy, right? We do that using the is proxy type, or it's a value, which means it's not registered as a proxy. Then we use CTAD to determine whether the argument passed right to our auto ref is an L value reference which means it must match our uh, a value, <coughs> or if it's passed by value, then it must be a proxy. And this at least allows us to have the same code. Now, auto ref, again, has to be generated using reflection with a lot of properties to make all of this work. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes here. Let's take a look <coughs> at ref t. Well, this gets a bit more complicated, right? At least I wasn't able to figure out how to do this nicely. I uh, hope someone else might be able to. <laughs> What we just do here is it's a macro because we need to hard code the type that we're trying to match. So uh, again, we have a proxy for and a value for, which allows us to determine whether a type T is, you know, not only a proxy or a value, but also of a specific type, right? We are able to get that information from some other piece of registration. And then we did define our ref vec type 
uh, in terms of those concepts, right? And then again, we're able to do CTAD to get that nice deduction. So we can use RefT for either an L value reference or for a proxy. Pointers are way nicer, right? Because we're just able to use concepts to deduce whether something is a pointer or a, or a value, right? The pointer doesn't decay where it does with references. So this is a lot nicer. And we're able to do the same for pointer two. It's a bit more complicated, right? We have to actually check if it matches the, uh, the type that we're trying to get a layout of, but it's way easier. Okay. Is everything clear so far? Or do you have some questions? Okay. Can you yeah? explain what this property syntax is in one of the classes? Uh, yeah, let's go back. Way back. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. We can do it again. Yeah. <coughs> There we are. Yeah. So property in this case matches. It's a property of string. And it, the L value that it returns equals that expression over there, right? Cold data asset ID. We'll actually get into how this works later in the presentation. But what actually you can think of it as soon as you hit asset ID, it calls a function, which basically equals that expression, right? Cold data asset ID, it <coughs> returns an L value reference. And the proxy or the, the property is able to pass that back to the caller. Does that make sense? Yeah, but is it a member? Is it a function? It is, object? it is pretending to be a member variable. Okay. But it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, it is. And we'll get into how it works exactly later in the talk. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Why is it? Okay. This is weird. <laughs> Wait, it's okay. My slides are doing something very interesting, let's say. Okay, let's just do this one here. Okay, this is where we were. So now we've just leveled the playing field, right? All this allows us to do is for modern C to do what you know data oriented design is already able to do, work with uh, layouts that are not continuous. But you know. Data oriented design is more than just, you know, having a structure of arrays, right? So I talked a bit about existential programming, right? So let's take a look at this, this optional right here. Um, we have this struct, we have two optional members. <coughs> but in a data oriented design, you might translate it to something like this, right? We have a core object, which is the data we'll, we will always have. Mm -hmm. And have, then we just map our additional data. Now, in practice, you wouldn't use STD map for this case, but you know, most of you will know its syntax. So that's why I used it here. And then if we take a look at the code you might write, right on the left-hand side, we're just going through each and every object and dealing with it, right? We have a lot of branching involved. On the right-hand side, even though the code isn't as pretty as I would like, Right? We're just going over each of these states where we know exactly what will happen. Like there's no branching in the bodies at all, right? This is the basis of existential programming. But you know, since we have a lot more information about this array, right? The way we're storing these optionals, why not just use reflection, right? And create a very nice interface for ourselves, right? So something like a filter deref, right? It dereferences our optionals. And then we're just able to pass it what we want to do, which optionals we want to dereference, right? This is clearly not possible in the language right now. <coughs> you know, once we get reflection, we can do stuff that's way crazier than this. And this now allows us to use the knowledge 
that the container has to get pretty good user code. And at the same time, we're not giving up any performance because all of this abstraction can relatively easily be you know, looked through by the compiler. Any questions? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> this relies on reflection, but uh, not on the code generation. Right? That's why you're using literals. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, I just made up the syntax because, you know, it's very hard to, you know, if we get reflection to see what kind of reflection we will get, it's basically just to indicate that this all happens at compile time. And whether it's actually going to be like this or it's going to have a different syntax that will just r depend on what we'll do. The, the core is the, the functionality here. The, the term at compile time, basically what range we want to get. And it's able to do some of the work for us. Okay. Yeah. OK, so let's take a look at a very edit, right? We have a, an object here, and it's pretty much the same, except instead of having two optionals, we've now just compounded that into one variant. We can pretty much keep the same structure, right, for the data-oriented design, except we now know that you know it's the map is going to match to either one of them. So on the left-hand side, we get you know a very nice std variant syntax, and on the right-hand side, the code is already a bit nicer, right? We're just iterating over these maps. And then we're just sort of composing our object. Again, we can use DREF here to just specify, you know, data is additional data one, whatever that syntax might look like in the future. And it can just do this work for us, right? We now have very simple loops. We know what data is in there. We're, we get rid of the branching. The range can maybe actually map nicely to the data. Maybe we just split the data completely. We can do a lot of stuff here. So this allows, I think, for way nicer use of, of data-oriented code. But let's take a look at you know, what Rust does, right? We get some, uh, some nice uh, pattern matching here. All right, so now we're getting really off trail, yeah? Right? So let's take a look at some Rust enums, right? We have our additional data, one and two. They have their data in there. I don't know how many people have seen this syntax before, but it behaves like an enum the way we know, except that every enum value is able to hold pretty much like a complete struct in and of itself, which means that in foo, we can just store one of these enums. And then in our function, we can pattern match to see whether the enum is one or two and extract the data and call our functions, right? But, you know, we should just be able to do this in, in C++, right? If we get pattern matching and we just write a function to Variatic enum, again, we have a lot of reflection power in this version of C++ that I'm using. We can just generate the std variant uh, member uh, functions for this type, and we should just be able to use <coughs> this, right? And more importantly, we should then just be able to take our foo, store it in some smart data-oriented <coughs> container, and that should be able to do all those same transformations. Now, there might be a possibility, at least the way I envision it, where our range for each or some other range-like algorithm should be able to take all of that information, right? And this is, this is quite problematic at the moment, right? How do we get the data that the container is providing? But if we're able to find some sort of solution for that, we should just be able to write some pattern matching code, which is very nice and clear and prevents us from forgetting a state and then just split it out into multiple loops going over the right data. Again, we're using that existential programming, but now it's all done under the hood, right? So we're getting really quite concise code, but we're getting a lot of the performance benefits from data-oriented code. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah. So, yeah? so is, is this layout a data-oriented layout or? Uh, it's not in this, in this example. Okay. Yeah, no, that's understandable. Okay. Some of you might be familiar with JavaScript, right? And in JavaScript, we get this very nice syntax to destructure and construct new objects, right? So if you look at that var combined, you see we take our core variable, right? There's no proper types in JavaScript. And we take our additional data too. We unpack those and then just repackage them in a new object. And we're just able to use this combined as if we declared it that way. This might be very useful if you have current data-oriented code, right? Currently, everything I've explained to you is very <coughs> modern C++, right? We're, we're using containers. 
we're declaring everything up front, which is very nice if you're already used to that way of thinking. But if you're currently doing data oriented, that doesn't match, right? So let's translate this to C++. If we have a function like restructure ref and we take two objects, right? We can just return some proxy reference like thing that does the same combination, right? So now you have all the flexibility of, of laying out your data by hand and collecting it. But as soon as you start writing functions, you just say, okay, I have two pointers, three pointers, references, whatever, and I'm just going to combine them into one object. <coughs> and now your transformations themselves get to be very clean. And again, this allows you to transfer data from one part to the other. This allows you a lot of flexibility and your transformations can stay the same. So I think this is really, really powerful. So let's take a look at how this would work with ranges or arrays, right? In JavaScript, we're able to just map and do this destructuring and constructing. And then we're just able to go over all of these and apply the function, right? Well, in C++, you can do pretty much the same thing, right? Using a zip transform. First, we zip a couple of ranges together. And then we just apply that restructure ref function to it, right? And then we get a nice range of our objects, and we're just able to do all of our normal translations to it. We might be, uh, even be able to write a function that does this explicitly, so it's uh, a bit more terse. But it does pretty much the same thing. OK, everyone with me so far? Yeah? So if you're, if you're doing this, this restructuring in the call each time and you're paying that cost of doing the restructuring are you are you still able you must be you must have to get a huge benefit from the restructuring to have to pay the cost of the restructuring each time. well there's not much cost to the restructuring right because basically we're just getting two iterators or pointers or or references we're able to store those just as in the um, structure of arrays example and then the function itself generates all of these properties, which again, the compiler can see through. And then the, the actual uh, thing itself, it's, it's pretty close to like the pair of, uh, that you would get from zip transform, except that it has a lot of nice syntax over it so you don't have to see it. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So I've been talking about this nice future C++ with reflection and all kind of cool stuff. And that's not where we are, right? There's quite a big gap between what I've been talking about and what we can actually get currently. So first of all, we need those properties, right? I showed them to you, I teased you a bit, but you know, how do, how do this actually work? So first, I'm going to go through my current implementation of them, which I don't like, right? Spoiler alert, my whole point here is we can't do it in library the way I did it. So if we actually translate it to the code I, I have, right? I, I have this tiny little library, which pretty much just serves to you know, make these slides work. <laughs> it's called CPP prop, right? Because it's properties for C++. And it is a couple of macros, because of course it is, right? If there's even more stuff here. You know, there was a lot of slideware. So let's take a look at what these macros actually do, right? First of all, we, we create our data. This is all the data that the, the properties need to be able to access. This is a relatively straightforward macro, right? This is the code it generates. And all it does is just takes this and puts it into two defined names, right? We want the name of the type, which always needs to be the same. And we need some uh, member variable, right? That's the CPP prop data M. Now let's take a look at the properties, right? This macro is starting to look a bit uglier. And this is starting to get into what we're actually doing, right? We have our property, which is a templated type on the string, right? Which is the type it's emulating. Then we have our, our data, which we've also just passed along, right? We can rely on that type being the same. And then our expression, we you know put that in a lambda, take a decal type of that lambda, and then we're able to pass it to the template, right? And that lambda, its argument is a pointer to that data. And this might give you a hint of where the UB is going to be in the future. <coughs> also note that we use no unique address, right? This is a completely empty struct. And we actually want it not to be laid out. We don't want it to take up any space, because that would just mean overhead that we don't need. 
Okay, so let's take a look at this property. This is the core of how this works, and this is also why there is guaranteed UB if you use properties, which is a, a nice property to have, right? <laughs> so what we do, we take this the this pointer of the property, which again is laid out in our surrounding struct, and we just cast it to the cppbob data t. We just do that. And that's basically how we're able to access that data. Now, this cost is completely illegal, right? There is no way <laughs> that the standard is like, no, nah, 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 this is fine. Even though we know it is correct, and even though the compiler you know, <clears throat> does what we want it to do, this is clearly not like a proper solution, right? It's nice to get some assembly up right now, but this just doesn't work. But we basically use this, uh, we wrap this in a getter, and then we implement some basic functions, and we specialize this property on the, on the type T for every type that we want to uh, have a property for. right? So that's, that's a lot of work. Maybe we can do this in the future using reflection. I'm not quite sure, sure yet. This requires lambdas in unevaluated, in unevaluated context, right? Sorry? This requires lambdas in unevaluated context. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. I have a question. Yeah? Uh, how is the this pointer of the property, even though this is undefined behavior, how is it even the same address as the base here? So if the property is like in the middle of the structure. Yeah, so this depends on your compiler. So in my example, for instance, for Clang, from my experimentation, right, which is a great way to do this kind of stuff, we know that it's actually zero. Uh, for MSVC, we know it's going to be behind so we actually use a, a size of. So it depends on per compiler where it's actually going to be laid out. <laughs> but you're putting all your properties at the start of the structure, right? So uh, let's take a look. Or before any other data members. Yeah, and that, that is important because otherwise, especially on MSVC, they might be laid out after. On Clang, it would be fine. But uh, with MSVC, if you put the properties, for instance, after the other member variables, <coughs> it would break. Like just without warning and your compiler will do weird stuff. And if I, you know, I've written this code, if I mess up a tiny bit, you get very weird assembly. So this is very brittle, right? You have to use this exactly right. And otherwise it doesn't work because it's UB, right? You don't get any guarantees here. Are all your types standard layout in, like in these uses? Um, yeah, they are. Because it, it seems like if you could just you know where like the acid ID property is, right? So, and you know what the type acid is because you can just shove it in your macro. It's, yeah. It's macros, you can shove whatever you want in there. You can just calculate the offset back out into asset and then go forward into property and then you don't have to worry about like any of this stuff, right? Oh, I don't think I follow you completely. Can you repeat? Well, okay, so now you're, you're relying on the fact that acid ID has to be declared immediately after the data because if you've been yeah. the same address. Um, but like we could just not rely on that, and we know we can we know what our we can figure out what our offset is from asset. Yeah. And we know what the properties offset the the data's offset from asset is. Yeah. Right? So we can just like subtract and, and add to to get to where it actually is instead of assuming that it's there. Okay. I was I'm as far as I knew all the offsets aren't. Uh, you know, completed yet because we're doing this inside the struct itself, right? So we don't have access to like so offset. But the this is in a body body. Body. Oh, in a lambda. Mm. Okay, I have to think about that. Okay. okay, so again, there's UB library implementation. Again, because it's a proxy object, you don't get the ADL you want, right? This has all the problems proxy objects have, and I can't solve that, right? There's, I don't know, maybe there are better people than me, but this, you know, this you quickly start running into issues when you're, you know, relying on some conversion that it doesn't see. If you have templated code, it will look at your, uh, your property, not at the data you're emulating, which is the behavior you'd like. So there's a lot of issues here. So with the whole, Proxy problems, I don't have some, don't have any solutions. But the UB, we could mitigate if we had some proposals accepted, right? Let's take a look at operator dot. This would 
do a lot of the work for us, right? And then we would just be able to access it, right? Operator dot explicitly add some space in the proposal to allow you to have multiple operator dots, so you could be able to import data, the data from multiple types. This is, you know, this would do a lot of the work for us. And then there's a similar proposal, right? Smart references through delegation. It would be a little bit different because the, the types would have to be external because we're using this sort of inheritance like syntax to use it. But again, it would solve our problem. Now, there's also uh, indirect value. I don't know if people are familiar. It would help a bit, but again, you'd lose the nice user code. So at least for this use case, it's not a solution. And that's because it's also library based and they don't propose UB. So yeah, you're limited in what you can do on, a, uh, on an interface level. OK. We just need reflection, right? I, I'm not the only one at this conference that thinks that's the case. We need it for everything I've shown, right? We needed to build those smart containers. We needed to generate the layouts. We needed to build the you know, proxy references. We just need reflection. I don't particularly care which of the proposals that have been proposed, you know, anything would just work. It's, I'm not doing very fancy stuff in the reflection, even though I've done it all by hand, of course, right? We just, we do need to be able to inspect uh, all class members, right? Private, <coughs> protected, public, because otherwise we cannot do all of this generation, right? And importantly, we also need to be able to reflect into seemingly unrelated uh, scopes and namespaces, right? Because we need to be able to do some registration in some external libraries. And we maybe need to generate some structs in, a, in another namespace. So even though you know a reflective call in a certain namespace, we, at least for the way I've implemented it, we would need to be able to you know, access other namespaces, right? We need to you know, go into the previous namespace or open a namespace from the global namespace. So that's at least an important note for uh, for my implementation. Okay. Yeah. I think if you if you want to uh, to consider classes with uh, both public and protected or private, etc., then they become non-standard layered. I think so. The offset is currently not really defined. So maybe you, reflection should also give you the offset, like the implementation defined offset of those fields, even when they're not standard layered. Uh, yeah. Maybe. But I, at the point that you would be using this, the, the structs would be complete. So I think you would have access to their offsets, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think if the class is not standard layout, then all these things are uh, racy, but I'm not sure. OK. I'm also not sure. <laughs> OK. Uh, what's next? <coughs> well, the way I see it, like this is a massive problem space, right? The, if we're starting to think about you know possible standardization in the space, all of these smart containers and you know let's not put an, uh, a specific structure of arrays implementation in the language, you know, assuming we have reflection. I think what is very important for standardization here is something like properties, right? Just accept operator dot for all I care, like just give me the tools, right? Same for reflection, we just need it. I think it might be useful once we get there to standardize something like the pointer and reference types I showed uh, I showed you, because they sh should be able to function like vocabulary types and allow many different libraries of many smart people that know way more about how to actually properly do data-oriented design than me to generate their own containers and have them all work with user code, right? So we don't all roll our own auto ref and pointer to. Um, also important here is the ability to register a link between the layouts, right? We need a way for a secondary layout to say, hey, I know I'm a different type, but actually I'm just a different layout for the primary type. And I blew through this way quicker than I expected. So any questions? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so have you, uh, are you experimenting with another non-library design, like say, for example, using Live plain to generate the reflection uh, stuff that you need that the language doesn't provide for you? Um, no, I haven't. <laughs> so yeah, I've just tried to see how far I can take a library approach. Uh, basically, this all started when the, first, the, the talk of reflection first started. And I was like, OK, let's see how difficult it would be to implement a, a structure of arrays. And you now 
I kept running into more and more problems, and that's where we are. Yeah. The ADL issue, could you use Nibloid to, to uh, avoid uh, that ADL kicks in? You might. I'm not familiar enough on Nibloids uh, to. I don't know that that would help much because the problem is that the property has extra associated namespaces, right? Yeah. And the Nibloids just limit triggering of argument dependent lookup. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the opposite side of the problem. Yeah. Okay. More restrictions rather than more open Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I like the API stability of being able to um, migrate from structs that have fields, <coughs> but being able to inject code into unrelated contexts seems like, and some of the other things seem like they're very much getting into a trade-off of, yes, on the one hand, it's nice that a user can write code and it does something, something completely different from what they thought it did. <laughs> on the other hand, the user is now writing code that like, when they look at the code, the code has nothing to do with what's happening. Yeah, that's true. I, I'm clearly in favor of you know more powerful reflection, but I understand that not everyone is in that same uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Can we use it? Um, yeah, there's this nice little Godbolt link here, yeah. which will show you the, the code that I have currently. And, uh, you know, you can toy around with it. But again, like, please don't use this in production. Like, <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> I don't want to get that, that call. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much.